Hello everyone, uh, happy Summer Spectacular. I hope you're enjoying the content and it's great to be a part of it this year. So um, what I'm going to do is that I've been talking about board games on the Dice Tower for a while and especially I've been talking about games I haven't played or games that, you know, I've played maybe comparing digital versus physical. But uh, today what I'm going to do is just share my top 10-ish with you. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm doing Dice Tower shenanigans. So yeah, I'm going to share my top 10, but it's not going to be necessarily my exact top 10 because I wanted to bring board games from different categories within this top 10, which is why it's more of an ish. Let's do it, shall we? And so typically for the Dice Tower top 10s, I'm going to sort of put one in here to capture a whole bunch of games and it's experiences but it's also puzzle games as well and for this I'm going to include the exit game so I absolutely love these exit games this is one of the newer jigsaw ones I haven't done it yet but uh, I did one already and it was just as much fun I love how there's so many things that are done with these exit games that are just fresh and new I know that some people feel they've seen things before and definitely you get used to looking how to uh, solve puzzles but I think nearly every single game there's always one solution which makes me go oh wow that's so cool and I just absolutely love that. In terms of sheer you know in terms of experiences yeah the first few games of Time Stories or uh, Pandemic uh, Legacy were amazing but these are much shorter experiences and yet I have probably got as many hours out of the exit games because there's so many of them as I have with say Time Stories. My experiences are my puzzly games, the exit games. So what about quick sort of filler games, fairly short ones? What about Roll and Write? Well, here's a game that covers both of those, and that is Welcome To. I talked about it recently. I said that I've been playing the digital version, and actually it was a game that I thought I would really enjoy in person. But yeah, Welcome To, it's a flip and write game. You're flipping over cards, and then you've got to write that number on your own particular tableau, and depending on how you do it, how you fill out your neighborhood, you can score points, and hopefully you win more. It's one of those games that you play it's a solo game that you play together but there's something about the interaction of being able to look at what other people are doing which makes it more than just simply a solo game and so yeah it's uh probably the newest game on my list most of them are I'll be honest, most of the games on this list are classics that I've had for years but this one has just it's just leapt to the front. I started playing it a few months ago and I'm just Oh, I'm just playing it so much. So yeah, for uh, a flip and write game and a really short filler and happily, it doesn't matter whether it's two player or 100 players, uh, welcome to. Let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum rather than a quick filler game. Let's go to one which burns your brain. And this for me is role player. So this is the min maxer's dream, right? This is all about optimizing. So you pull dice from a bag as a group, you draft those dice, and then you've got to put them in your player area. And you're trying to put these different dice so that maybe you have a total of 13 in a particular row or 18 in another or maybe you want the colors to match because they're all different colored dice it's such an amazing uh, game and the fact that it was the first from thunderworks as soon as i saw uh, tom vassal review it i was like this is a game that i've got to have it's it's absolutely a brain burner game it's not something you can go into simply it doesn't take a massive amount of time to play um, but oh my word, you're you're thinking hard on this one. And so if you really want that min-max uh, optimization game, then this for me is, a, is the one. So I realize that I don't play many, what most people play, but, uh, uh, gateway games. And I, I love Carcassonne, I love Ticket to Ride, but I don't actually own them. The one game that I would try and get people to play that's fairly simple and fairly straightforward is Blue Moon City. I have the uh, original version. It's actually a Polish version because it was out of print for so long. And once I played it in a games cafe, it's like, I need this game in my life. And so I, I got a Polish version, but that's fine because the cards are all language independent. So you're moving your 
um, your players, your tokens around a board. You're trying to get them into different areas of the city to collect resources, and then you can flip those tiles over, and you're trying to beat the opponents. Um, it's a really, really good sort of fun game, uh, but it is really simple. It's really easy to teach. It's really easy to pick up, and I, I just really enjoy it. I think, I, I think I'm a little bit sad that the artwork is... It's pretty artwork on the new version, but I prefer the original artwork. And I just think, yeah, I think that the original is a much better production. But um, yeah, absolute classic game. I love worker placement games, I really do. And I realize that I have more of them in my collection than any other type of game. Uh, in fact, I love them so much that I'm actually, I've got two that I'm trying to develop myself because who doesn't want to make a board game, right? So yeah. Uh, and if I'm looking back at what my favorite worker placement is, I don't know whether this is necessarily my favorite worker placement, though I think it is, but it certainly has a huge part in my heart and that is Lords of Waterdeep. So when I was first getting into board games, Lords of Waterdeep had just come out. I'm a big Forgotten Realms fan. I've got two bookcases full of Forgotten Realms books and I played Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter Nights. And so having this theme, it allowed me to, it, it, it gave me that link to the things I already knew. It's a great worker placement. You're placing your workers out to try and collect cubes and then you're trying to complete uh, these adventures, I guess. I have the upgraded figures, the little meeples for the different types of worker. I definitely want to play it with Scandrels of Skullport the expansion. I think it's a brilliant and it added this thing called Corruption, which is just, it, it brings in this extra factor to think about. I will say that it's also a game I've played with new players quite easily. The learning curve isn't too much uh, to bring in new players. And so it's, and for me, it this was the gateway game for me. This is the one that brought me in. It, just come out like say when I got into board gaming again um so I absolutely love this is it my absolute favorite worker placement is it the best one I don't know there's so many things that I love about Tolkien I absolutely adore this worker placement game it's got a big dial in the middle and you the longer you leave your workers out the different actions you can take or maybe the more resources you get I love this game, but there's Lords of Waterdeep, just it has a place in my heart because it brought me into gaming. I haven't put any sort of social deduction games on here. I'm not really a big fan of party games. I don't mind them, but it, it's not really sort of what I choose to play. However, there is one game so that I absolutely love, and that is room 25 so room 25 if anyone's seen the horror film the cube where there's a lot of people and they wake up and they're all in these different rooms and the rooms move around and so some of them have traps some of them have clues some of them have all this different thing um it's a it's a it's a really cool horror film for me i love it and room 25 completely gets takes that film source and turns it into a board game which is really exciting and you can play it cooperatively but i like it when you play it in semi-cooperative where there is a traitor and no one knows and maybe there's one traitor maybe there's two traitors maybe there's not actually a traitor but no one knows that and so everyone's suspicious i think once you've got that element of being you know like what are you doing what are you doing did you do this to this or are you just being selfish you know or was it just that you forgot I love the paranoia that it induces. It's so much fun. Um, I played this a few times with my board game group. Uh, I, I remember one game in particular, which I absolutely loved. And everyone knew that I was the traitor right from the start because I am terrible. I do not have a poker face. I was giggling. So everyone knew I was the traitor. I thought I was being, no, I didn't think I was being sneaky. I was trying to be, but I just no, I wasn't succeeding. And so basically I got killed off right at the beginning of the game. But you never actually reveal whether you, the, you were the traitor or not. And so I carried on and I was watching the game being played and I was just joining in and saying, oh, is that that? Is that that? And then I started sowing in little seeds of distrust like, oh, that was weird. Why did you do that? Oh, why did you do that? Now, I probably, I don't know whether that's really fair to do, but it was really good fun. I just started sowing little seeds of distrust at everyone. And so everyone became really paranoid. And because it was, I'd been kicked out so early in the game, everyone forgot that I'd played. 
And so they just started turning on each other and everyone was, uh, you know, trying to kill each other. Everyone was super suspicious of what was going on. It was just a paranoia extravaganza. It was absolutely fantastic. And what was hilarious is that I think that like one person or two people escaped and a whole bunch of people got left behind. No one trusted anyone. So basically they didn't really win the game. And as soon as they finished, as soon as they finished, they looked at me and were like, you were the traitor. But they just completely forgot. And it was amazing. It was, am oh, oh, that was puppet mastery at its best. That was one of my favorite gaming experiences ever. And it came from this game, Room 25. Fantastic. <sighs> And earlier we had a uh, brain burner game. I gave you role player as my brain burner game, uh, but for really trying to work out puzzles, for really trying to figure out what's going on, then I love Alchemists. Alchemists is such an amazing game. Again, I love the artwork. I know that there are some that think that the fantasy uh, artwork and setting is sort of very generic but for me it's something that I love I'm a complete fantasy nerd so it brings me into games uh, more than other themes do especially real life themes uh, in Alchemist you're trying to collect resources and then you it was one of the first app driven games and you use the app to look at what happens when you combine these two ingredients that you have and then you use that to deduce what might be the constitution uh, elements of that particular uh, uh, material that you're working with. It's wonderful. It's, it's like I say, it's a real brain burner game. Uh, I did actually manage to teach it to my mum and get my mum to play. And my mum is really not a gamer and she enjoyed it because she enjoys that figuring out puzzle aspect. Although I realise that there is quite a steep learning curve. There's a lot of different places on the board to do things. It's got an almost worker placement aspect. So it's a big teach, um, but it's such a great game and the expansion what i liked about the expansion to it was that it had like six mini expansions in it and so you know maybe you can change the starting resources or you can change this or you can change that i like expansions where it just sort of tweaks some of the things that you're doing and you can choose what you're putting in and pulling out and so uh yeah alchemist with the expansion or without the expansion doesn't really matter I don't see this game got in enough love and it is amazing. Now what about big sprawling adventure? I love Dungeons and Dragons and so I like it when a game can sort of replicate that feeling but you don't need a dungeon master and also you can play it in one session even if it's a long session. So for me the closest board game I think to that Dungeons and Dragons feel is Legends of Andor. So I have all the expansions for this, the big box and the short box, uh, small boxes. And I just love the way this works. I like the way that the enemies move and you move them around. And I will say that it got sort of refined as the game went on. Because you sort of want to be able to kill all the monsters, but with this you've got to sometimes choose to let some through because you're on a time limit as well. I love the fact that you're going out and exploring things. The original box had two different sides of the map and it came with, I think, th six different stories which sort of follow on from each other. Um, and then the next two big box expansions sort of continued that story, which is amazing. It is, it, it's, it is a big epic sprawling adventure game there's no two ways about it and i realize that again this generic fantasy theme may put some people off but for me i think we've already uh, determined i'm a big old nerd for fantasy so it works really well um i am i'm really looking forward to the adventures of robin hood which is i think the same designer and it's got interesting aspects where you change the board up a little bit i think that's just being released i kind of want to go to the uk board games expo to just to see it um another one from cosmo apparently i'm a big old cosmo fangirl but there you go now if you want a shorter uh, adventure type game then um i love near and far near and far is a wonderful adventure game but you know you're only talking an hour to two hours it's a lot quicker it's still got this lovely aspect where um when you're looking at what's happening next you go into a board and uh, into a, a book and so you know depending on what cards you played or where you are depends which pages and paragraphs you read 
This is a wonderful game. I think the only thing that stops this being on this list above uh, Legends of Andor, and Legends of Andor is much more sprawling, but I want a cooperative game. I like competitive games, but I think if this was cooperative, I'd prefer it so much more. And I realised this was a cooperative version. Uh, but this is where I think I should buy Sleeping Gods. I haven't been able to yet, but Sleeping Gods is Ryan Lockett. It's got the beautiful artwork. It's got the storybook. It's got the adventure. Um, uh, but it's also a cooperative game. And so I think as much as I love Near and Far, I think that if I play Sleeping Gods, I won't have any need for Near and Far anymore. But I'm curious. I guess I'll find out at some point soon. So if we're looking at sort of resource management and if we're looking at a deck builder game, then the go-to for me is a game called Seasons. Seasons is just such a great game. You're rolling dice, you're using, and then you're drafting that dice to get resources and you use them to buy cards. And with that, you're building basically your deck building, you're building an engine. And so you're hoping that you're going to be able to score more points than your opponents. It's such a wonderful game. I've had this for a long time. It's got really beautiful, big, chunky dice that I just really enjoy rolling, I'll be honest. it The artwork is gorgeous. It is absolutely stunning. It, for me, it's just absolutely beautiful to look at. Um, I will say that I've played it with four players and three players a number of times and I feel like it's really strongest at two, especially once those two people know what they're doing. It moves forward at quite a click, you know, I can play it in 40 minutes, whereas a, two, a four player game, especially with uh, new players, it can take sort of way over two as I found out at some uh, board game nights. But yeah, I really love this. Um, I will say this is where I'm doing some shenanigans and I'm trying to bring in an extra game. I think 51st State is probably another one of my deck building engine building, uh, engine building games and I absolutely love this and I think that well 51st state is in my top 10 games but because i'm trying to go for one sort of engine building game i i went for seasons over 51st state it just has the edge but um in terms of pure top 10 then 51st state is definitely in there so shenanigans but this is my uh second choice at this number All right, so my number one game, my favorite number one game, what is it? So like with Water, Lords of Waterdeep and Seasons was one of the first games I got. And another one of the first games I got was Mage Knight. And I realized that with Waterdeep, I had this sort of fairly easy gateway game. And I also bought the opposite end of the spectrum with Mage Knight. I talk about big sprawling games with um, Legends of Vandal, well, Mage Knight is another one of those. You know, a game can easily take four uh, hours and it can pretty much be four hours per player, to be perfectly honest. So this is a game that I usually play solo, but I love it. What I really love is that you're building a deck and you're going out and you're exploring the countryside. The countryside reveals as you go along, but I love the combat. So you're building a deck and then you have to use your cards for fight or blocking or for movement or whatever it is. And so there's a management aspect of the game there. And, you know, you really want to sort of build a good deck, but you can get away with some duds, you know. I mean, it's if one bad choice ruined a four hour game, there'd be serious problems there. And I just love the way it plays. I love the way combat works out. It's just so interesting to me. Yes, there are so many rules. It makes it really complicated. I played it once with somebody else and it was an eight hour game. And that's just not really practical. For me, this is a sort of solo experience, pretty much. Um, but I really enjoy it. It gives me that I, uh, that feeling of going out and adventuring and trying to discover things. And uh, there are campaign rules online, which I've downloaded. I maybe don't play it as much as I'd like because it, it does also take up a lot of space. And so that can, you know, if you've got a small table, then that can really limit whether you can play it or not. But 
It's not a game that I play that often, but when I do, I know that this is just going to be the most fun gaming I have. And so that's it. That's my top 10 with a few others snuck in there. Like I say, I tried to cover um, different types of game, not just... I didn't want to have too many similar games. And so I think that there's something about each of these games which makes it slightly unique. Most of them are quite old. I realise that there's some games on there I talked about. Sleeping Gods might take over from near and far. And uh, the Legend of Robin Hood, the Adventures of Robin Hood might take over from Legends of Andor. But I don't own any of the, either of those yet. Could be that this list is different in 12 months time. But uh, yeah, they're my top 10. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Maybe you found out about some new games or find out something about me and until next time uh take care enjoy the rest of your summer spectacular and uh go dice team